Palace of Auburn Hills, to sports fans and many pop culture enthusiasts, needs no introduction. The iconic sports venue was believed to have plenty of life left, with renovations having been complete only six years prior to the arena's demolition. Join me today as we review the story of this historic structure, why it's so significant, and why it was ultimately demolished in July 2020. My name is Lee Brees, and this is Modern Ruins, Episode 5. Like many modern arenas in America, their history begins with the migration or formation of a professional basketball team. In 1974, the founder of the Detroit Pistons, Fred Zollner, sold his team to Bill Davidson. Decades before, Zollner founded the team as the Fort Wayne Zollner Pistons in Fort Wayne, Indiana, named for his company that manufactured pistons for a variety of applications. He relocated his team to Detroit after the 1956-57 season, as many teams located in smaller markets had been moving to larger markets during that time. When they arrived, they played in Olympia Stadium, also known as Detroit Olympia, for their first four seasons and then moved to the new Cobo Hall. In 1974, when Zollner sold the team to Davidson, the Pistons had played 14 seasons at the arena, Hall was a much more fitting name for the building, as the max capacity was only 12,000 spectators. In 1976, the NBA-ABA merger, which kickstarted the modern NBA, was finalized. And as the NBA continued to grow, Davidson knew that Cobo Hall wasn't the best place for his recently acquired ball club to flourish and compete with the more established franchises. The Hall's tiny size also gave the Pistons the second worst attendance record in the league at the time. Both the Pistons and the Red Wings, Detroit's professional hockey team, had their eyes on the recently opened Pontiac Silver Dome, located 30 miles outside Detroit, where the Lions football team of the NFL had already relocated to. Other than the Astrodome, it was the only enclosed stadium built for professional sports in the country and was very much a revolution in stadium architecture at that time. Detroit faced with losing two major revenue sources and drivers of traffic to its downtown proper, offered the long-established Red Wings a proposal to construct a new arena located directly next to Cobo Hall, to which the city would charge much lower rent than the managers of the Silver Dome, and would give the operational control of the new arena, Cobo Hall, and their parking lots to the team. The Red Wings opted to accept the city's offer. The newer and less established Pistons were not afforded the same proposal and were instead offered to be tenants in Detroit's new Red Wing controlled arena, to which Davidson passed on and proceeded to move his team to the Silver Dome in 1978. In what was a very large contrast to the relatively low capacity Cobo Hall, it became clear after playing several seasons at the stadium that it still wasn't the best spectator experience for watching basketball games. The Pistons, during their time at the Revolutionary Complex, also had a contentious relationship with management. And after a tear in the Silver Dome's roof in 1985 caused the Pistons to play the rest of the season at the Red Wings' Joe Louis Arena, Davison decided to construct an arena solely dedicated for hosting his Pistons basketball team. Unlike the Silver Dome, which was funded by the city of Pontiac, Davidson opted to fund the new arena entirely with private funds, which was unprecedented and it was the first time doing so had ever been done. Davison opted to build his new sports entertainment venue only four miles from the Silver Dome in the city of Auburn Hills. The new venue would be designed by Rossetti Architects, who had never designed an arena before. They moved suites and skyboxes down lower from where they were in other arenas, only 16 rows above the main floor, and gave it an astonishing 180 suites which many thought was an insane number at the time, as most venues had almost none of them. The suite's relocation and quantity would allow the new venue to command higher prices for them and produce more revenue. All the seats in the arena were padded, which greatly improved acoustics for concerts. The fan-focused experience in the design, coupled with the suites, would make the new arena very profitable, which surprised people given the location. And given the influence it would have on future sports venues across the country, Many considered it to be the first NBA arena of the modern era, 
even as much to say it inspired the building boom of the new NBA arenas in the 1990s as others sought to capture the success and profitability the venue had given its large number of suites. Davidson, along with his partners, David Hermelin and Robert Sosnick, formed a joint venture, Arena Associates, and financed $90 million to construct the arena, which is considered a small amount even by the standards of the day. Notable groups for the project included McClurgan Associates Incorporated as the structural engineer, R.E. Daly and Company as the general contractor, and Frank Wewald and Sons as the project manager. Ground was broken on June 7, 1986, and construction continued for a little over two years. 300 miles of electrical wire was used in the building, and there was enough concrete in the structure to pave a two-lane highway 23 miles long. Bill Davidson and his team hosted a name competition for the new sports entertainment complex, with 1,600 of the 100,000 entries being the Palace. Davidson's team then selected five of those entrants to be in a top hat drawing for a lifetime pass to the new venue, with Jonathan Binder, a 20-year-old from Flint, being the winner. The Palace of Auburn Hills opened on August 13, 1988, with a capacity of 22,000 fans for basketball and 8,400 parking spaces. The arena was a big gamble, not only given its large number of suites and location, but the biggest threat to the success of the palace was that most family and traveling shows were under a 10-year contract to play in downtown Detroit, meaning that Pistons basketball and concerts would be the only entertainment Davidson could sell for several years. This proved to be a non-issue. The first event was a Sting concert, who was promoting his second solo album since leaving the police. Elton John and Michael Jackson both would play sold-out concert series within the first month of the grand opening, and the first sporting event wouldn't come until November 5th, 1988, when the Pistons beat the Charlotte Hornets, 94-85. The timing of the new arena couldn't have been better. The Pistons would go on to finish the 1988-1989 season 63-19 and and sweep the Los Angeles Lakers four games to none in the NBA Finals when the Palace was only 10 months old. The Bad Boys, as the Pistons team in this era came to be called, would finish the following season 59-23 and and return to the 1990 NBA Finals to beat the Portland Trailblazers four games to one, winning a total of two NBA championships within the first two years of the arena. For context, most sports venues will go their whole life without hosting any championships and then either be demolished or relegated to hosting the annual Boat and RV show. In addition to the Pistons, other sports teams would call the Palace home, such as the Detroit Shock of the WNBA, the Detroit Vipers, Detroit Rockers, Detroit Neon Safari, and the Detroit Fury. With the arena also hosting NCAA tournament games, boxing matches, and countless other events throughout its life. In addition to Michael Jackson, Elton John, and Sting, so many artists would play the venue in its first two years, including Bon Jovi, Paul McCartney, Billy Joel, Madonna, Prince, David Bowie, Kiss, Iron Maiden, and so, so many more. Not to mention all the artists who would come to play the palace in the coming decades. U2 would come to Auburn Hills in 1992 on their Itsu TV tour, and Bono would surprise audience members by ordering 10,000 pizzas for them while on stage. The first of several improvements came in 1996 when the West Entrance Atrium was added to the venue, which added a new distinctive look for what many regarded as the number one arena in the NBA. The upper floors were used as office space for palace management, while the main level featured plenty of space for fans to enter and exit the venue and had a Pistons locker room store. Over the course of the 1990s, every artist imaginable would come to the palace for a show, including Old Blue Eyes himself, Frank Sinatra. The Pistons' success would go sour as the decade wore on, and it wouldn't be until the new millennium that the team's success would pick up again. The Pistons would make the Eastern Conference Finals in 2003, but wouldn't make the return to the NBA Finals until winning the franchise's third NBA championship in 2004, defeating Kobe Bryant and the Los Angeles Lakers four games to one. However, despite the growing legacy of the Pistons basketball team and the outstanding reputation the Palace had as one of the best NBA arenas, the defining moment of the venue's legacy and what generations of sports fans across America will remember it for would come in one single night. 
and go on to be known as the most infamous brawl to occur in sports history. November 19th, 2004 didn't necessarily begin like any other day. The NBA season had just started, and already, the Indiana Pacers and Detroit Pistons were meeting for the first time since a contested matchup in the 2004 Eastern Conference Finals, to which the Pistons won four games to two and went on to win their first NBA championship in more than a decade. The game was broadcast on ESPN in addition to each team's local broadcast network. The Pacers went into the contest, having won two games in a row and touting a 6-2 record, while the defending champs had only a 4-3 record and already seemed to be in a slump. The Pacers jumped out to a 20-point lead mid-second quarter, a lead that despite Pistons' efforts, they would never rescind. Throughout the game, nearly every second of momentum the Pistons would have quickly became squashed by a three-point shot or Pacers' offensive run and Pistons' team members became frustrated. Despite the lopsided score, both teams kept most of their star players in the game, with Reggie Miller, the star player of the Pacers, sitting out due to injury. The Pacers were led in scoring by small forward Ron Artest, who dropped 24 points in the contest, and remained in the game until the very end. With 45.9 seconds to go, and the Pacers up 97-82, to Artest slapped Pistons center Ben Wallace across the back of the head during a layup attempt. Wallace immediately responded by shoving Artest in the face with both hands. The ref and each team's bench rushed to the two players to prevent a fight from breaking out. With the players, the media, nor the fans having any idea how the night's events would go on to unfold. Ron Artest had laid down on the scorer's table in an attempt to calm down while Pacers and Pistons players were at midcourt attempting to do the same thing. With the Pistons focused on trying to restrain their center, Wallace then proceeded to throw a towel at Artest, which caused him to stand up before being held down by coaches and players. 90 seconds after the initial shove, Artest would break free of their grip as Pistons fan John Green, wearing a light blue jersey, threw a drink at Artest, which landed right on his chest. Artest immediately jumped into the stands, going directly for Michael Ryan, whom Artest thought was responsible for throwing the drink at him. Pacers radio broadcaster Mark Boyle attempted to stand up and hold back Artest, but was trampled in his efforts, and suffered five fractured vertebrae and a gouge in his head as a result. Numerous Pacers and Pistons players and personnel, in addition to some of the broadcast crew, ran immediately after Artest to break up the fighting. Green, who threw the drink, swung two punches at Artest in the back of the head. Another Pistons fan, William Paulson, then threw his drink in Artest's face, which caused Pacers player Steven Jackson, who was already attempting to help Artest, to punch Paulson. Ben Wallace's brother, David Wallace, would also swing a punch at Pacers player Fred Jones. As the events continued to quickly unfold, more fans began throwing drinks food, and other objects at players, and some began to enter the court. Artest then exited the stands and returned to the floor, where he was confronted by two more fans, A.J. Shackelford and Charlie Haddad. Artest punched Shackelford, to which Haddad then intervened before both fell to the floor. While on the floor, Haddad was struck in the back of the head by Pacers player Anthony Johnson, and as he attempted to stand up, He was punched in the jaw by Jermaine O'Neal, who had a running start. William Wesley of Pistons personnel and Pacers player Austin Crozier then pulled Artest away from fans and restrained him in the middle of the court, with coaches trying to calm him down. The scene was unsightly to behold and had become overwhelmingly chaotic, as outnumbered arena security officials struggled to return order to the palace. Children and other fans began to cry from fear and shock at what the basketball game was turning into and the uncertainty stemming from the situation. Auburn Hills Police Department had three officers present in the arena during the altercation, but were unprepared and overwhelmed once players began entering the stands, in addition to not knowing who Reggie Miller was. With fans on the court adding to the chaos, there was seemingly no way out. 
Pacers players and coaches began rounding each other up and were escorted by game officials and security as they fought their way to the locker room. Fans continued to shower players with beverages, food, and other debris, with a metal folding chair nearly missing O'Neal as he left the court and striking two fans. Referees called the game with 45.9 seconds left unfinished, rewarding Pacers with the win. Pistons coach Larry Brown had tried to calm fans over the Palace's PA system and deter the situation, but accomplished nothing and threw the mic down in exasperation. John Mason, the Pistons announcer at the Palace, then began to demand that fans leave the arena and go home and pleaded with them to stop throwing objects and engaging in fights. More police officers then arrived and swarmed the palace, threatening to handcuff anyone who wouldn't leave. Police then went to the players' locker rooms where fighting had continued in the Pacers' camp and attempted to make arrests, but the team rushed to their bus and refused to get off. The police officers then decided to protect the Pacers as they left the arena and would make arrests after reviewing footage from the game. By this point, dozens of police vehicles lined the parking lots and roads outside the palace as they still were trying to get fans to leave and secure the area. In total, nine spectators were injured, with two taken to the hospital. NBA Commissioner David Stern, who was watching the game on television at home, recalls saying holy as the fight broke out. Jermaine O'Neal said later that as bad as it looked on TV, it was 20 times worse in person. Pacers assistant coach Chuck Pearson compared the situation to gladiators trapped in a lion's den with no way out. Of all the players on both teams, Tyshawn Prince was the only one who never left the bench during the entire incident and was the only player ineligible for suspension. Nine players would be suspended for a total of 146 games with the suspended players losing a total of $11 million in salary. Ron Artest would receive the longest suspension, losing out on the rest of the season, which included 73 regular season and 13 playoff games, missing out on $5 million of his salary. Jermaine O'Neal was suspended for 25 games, but was reduced to 15 games after filing an appeal in court, and also lost out on $4.1 million. The fallout from the tragic night, known today as the Malice at the Palace, didn't stop there. Auburn Hills police used media footage to identify John Green as the fan who threw the drink at our test, who just so happened to have been the former neighbor of the Oakland County prosecutor, David Gorsica. On November 30th, 2004, Palace Sports and Entertainment permanently banned both Green and Haddad, who had interactions with our test, from attending any events at the Palace and revoked their season tickets. Green had a criminal history and was out on a court-ordered probation from a DUI conviction at the time of the incident. Green was later allowed to attend non-sporting events at the Palace, but was sentenced to 30 days in jail and two years probation for punching our test. Three more fans would be permanently banned from attending Pistons home games and a total of five Pacers players and five Pistons fans were charged with varying levels of assault and battery. Bryant Jackson, who had thrown the folding chair at O'Neal, pleaded no contest to a felony assault charge. He was sentenced to two years probation in order to pay $6,000 in restitution. David Wallace was sentenced to one year probation and community service for punching Pacers guard Fred Jones from behind. All the charged players pleaded no contest and were sentenced to one year probation, 60 hours of community service, a $250 fine, and anger management counseling. Media reaction largely blamed Pacers players for causing the incident, pointing fingers at our test and the other players involved, ignoring the role fans played in the event. After the brawl, the NBA reformed their security measures, namely issuing new security guidelines for all NBA arenas, limiting the size of an alcoholic drink that can be sold at a game to 24 ounces, banning the sale of alcoholic drinks after the third quarter, and mandating that three security guards always be between players and fans. The night's events would be talked about frequently on sports radio and talk shows for more than a decade, and go on to inspire a documentary on Netflix that premiered on August 10, 2021. Despite the brawl, the Pistons team was still having great success, and the event brought nationwide attention and notoriety to the palace. 
The Pistons would finish the season 54-28 and and returned to the 2005 NBA Finals, but lost to the San Antonio Spurs four games to three. Given the popularity and success of both the Pistons and the arena, management opted to increase the Palace's amenities in order to improve the fan experience and raise profits. In 2004, LED boards were installed all around the interior portion of the venue, dramatically changing the fan experience. One year later, management undertook a $30 million expansion that included the addition of the Courtside Club, an exclusive Courtside Lounge, and two more clubs on the concourse level. The Courtside Club was five 450-square-foot underground luxury suites that sat at floor level, without any courtside view, but came with courtside tickets, and rented for $450,000 per year. The new features were complete and ready for the Pistons' season in November 2005. The improvements to the Palace would continue into 2006, as a 65,000-square-foot expansion of the North Entrance was added, renamed to the North Pavilion. The President's Club on its upper level featured a central bar and clubs surrounded by eight private luxury suites that each contained a thousand square feet. The club also had an exclusive tunnel that would take you from the North Pavilion to the hundred suite corridor into the arena, accessible only by club members. One of the only complaints of fans was that being located in the country, for lack of a better term, there wasn't a whole lot to do before and after games. So in addition to the profit-raising President's Club and suites, retail and dining options were added. The first level of the North Pavilion was a new grand entrance to the arena. The new concourse space allowed for retail and casual dining amenities to be added, and the new dining court would feature B-dubs, the Red Bull Bar, Captain Morgan's Bar, and other eateries, which would change over time. This added to the fan experience, but also increased revenue sources with the new addition acting as event space for corporate gatherings or party bookings. The North Pavilion opened in April 2006. On March 13, 2009, Bill Davidson, the longtime owner of the Pistons and developer of the Palace, passed away at the age of 86, and the court of the Palace was named in his honor. His widow Karen immediately began overseeing operations of the ball club, and would do so for the next two years as the performance of the Pistons on the court began to drop. It was well understood that Karen's management of the ball club was not a long-term solution, and the long-awaited deal to sell the team and the Palace, as being privately owned, they were a package deal, to Michigan State alum and longtime Michigan resident Tom Gores was finalized in May 2011. Tom Gores, originally from Israel, was a billionaire who founded a private equity firm in California. The total sale price for the team and the palace was $325 million, considered a shocking bargain by the media. Despite the Pistons' continuing poor performance resulting in slowly decreasing attendance numbers, Gores poured millions into revamping the palace. Gores began a $15 million renovation project in 2012 that would renovate the main concourse and club in the West Entrance, renovate 40 suites on the 100 level, and remove 16 suites on the 300 level to create Club 300, an open-air lounge available to all ticket buyers to enjoy food and beverages with direct views of the court below. Even with Gores making these improvements to a largely not outdated 25-year-old sports entertainment venue, a new project in downtown Detroit would prove too tempting for the billionaire to pass up. In 2013, Olympia Entertainment, a subsidiary of the Red Wings' parent company, announced they would be building a new arena for the Red Wings in their proposed entertainment district. The proposal suggested that the city's downtown development authority own and lease the land to Olympia Entertainment rent-free, giving the latter complete control over the arena. This proposal ended up looking very similar to the situation the Red Wings had originally with Joe Louis Arena. However, The arena was only part of the much bigger project that Illich Holdings, Red Wings and Olympia Entertainment's parent company, wanted to construct. The company envisioned a 50-block district known as District Detroit, which included a new arena, a new global headquarters for Little Caesars, Wayne State University Business School, several new hotels and existing hotel renovations, new retail, office, and residential buildings, and many, many more projects. 
Illich Holdings was asking for a public-private partnership to finance the expected $650 million development, of which $450 million would go to the arena. They anticipated the creation of 5,500 jobs alone in the event center, as it was called at the time, and 8,300 overall in the district, and a $1.8 billion impact to Detroit. With the proposal approved by city leaders, groundbreaking for the new arena, designed to be the epicenter of hockey, was on July 20, 2014. More than two years later, in November 2016, with the new venue more than half finished, the Pistons suddenly announced they would be moving from Auburn Hills to the new district for the 2017-2018 NBA season. With the team left out of the planning phase for the new venue, plans had to quickly be accommodated to incorporate the team into what was supposed to be a hockey arena, with more than $40 million in changes needed to be made and required city approval. On June 20, 2017, the Detroit City Council approved the changes and the NBA Board of Governors approved the move unanimously on August 3, 2017, making the move official. Two months later, it was announced that Palace Sports and Entertainment, owned by Gores, and Olympia Entertainment, owned by Illich Holdings, would merge to form a joint venture, 313 Presents LLC, that would control bookings and event management at both facilities, but with the Pistons relocating back to downtown Detroit, the fate of the Palace was sealed. The Pistons would play the final sporting event at the Palace on April 10, 2017, losing to the Washington Wizards 105-101, with Boban Marjanovic being the last Pistons player to score a basket in the arena. Marking the end of not only a historic era for the Palace and Pistons basketball, but also the end of a 42-year run of professional sports in Oakland County. By the ribbon-cutting of Little Caesars Arena on September 5, 2017, the development project was more than 30% over budget, with taxpayers directly paying $350 million and $285 million in public bonds being issued to finance the project, with Illich Holdings covering the rest. Later in 2017, Bob Seger would host the final concert at the arena on September 23rd, and the last event ever to be held within the palace walls was a wine-tasting event by the local Chamber of Commerce on October 12th, 2017, and the venue was permanently closed soon after that, with several notable items and many furnishings sent to private auction. Despite the closure, the palace still had a relevant layout and design, and having been recently renovated, was still considered a top condition sports entertainment complex, with one major flaw. Even though the arena itself was still in great shape, the trend of walkable urbanism was all the rage, and just as with the Silver Dome, it just wasn't the trend anymore for fans to flock from Detroit or other places in the area for events. Not to mention for reoccurring mundane events, such as NBA basketball games. In August 2018, the center scoreboard, which had been installed in the palace brand new in 2014, had been removed from the arena and sold to the Arizona Coyotes of the NHL for use in their arena. Later in October, Oakland University attempted to buy the palace, but Gores and the university never reached an agreement, as the university couldn't find a private developer willing to partner with them in the deal. On June 24, 2019, the palace's anticipated fate was finally confirmed when it was announced that the arena would be sold to a joint venture firm between Tom Gores and Michigan-based Shostak Brothers and Company. The final sale price for the 110-acre property was only $22 million. Demolition began in late 2019, with the final implosion of the 32-year-old sports complex coming on July 11, 2020. The plans for the site have yet to be finalized, but it's anticipated that the joint venture will build an office park with light retail in its place. As light industry and tech are in big demand in the area, the Pistons practice facility and former headquarters was left standing, and no plans for what it may be repurposed to have been announced as of writing this video. The Palace of Auburn Hills has to be one of the most iconic arenas, not just of its era, but of all time. The building was a huge gamble moving outside the downtown area, which it seldom struggled with for most of its life. 
The Palace was one of only two modern arenas to never sell naming rights, and was one of only eight that were privately owned. The Palace ushered in a new era of sports arenas, ones of which will most likely outlive their predecessors by large margins. In its early years, the revolutionary design made it the place to host a sports game or a concert. The Palace of Auburn Hills and the events that took place there transcend the time period in which it was placed, and sports and music fans will be talking about the palace for generations to come. I'm honestly very sad to see this place go. I remember the brawl when it happened and how big of a deal it was. Plus, how many venues today can say they hosted a Michael Jackson concert series when most were lucky to have the Megastar play one concert before the pop star began exclusively touring internationally? The arena had a lot of life left in it, and I firmly believe its lifespan was cut short with renovations being complete just six years before the structure was entirely torn down. The problem is, given the location, I'm just not sure what the space could have been used for. And it's an even bigger question as to if the arena could remain profitable without an anchor main tenant. Love or hate Tom Gores, this is what you got. So be thankful for the memories and the championships that were won there. Please update the brief Wikipedia page and keep telling the stories. As long as the stories are told, the legacy of the palace will continue to live forever. And on that note, thank you for watching. Subscribe to Labrice TV for more Modern Ruins content. And be sure to comment what Modern Ruin you'd like us to cover next. <laughs>